Welcome to another episode of The Diplomats. We are going to be going through the Season 5 Online Nexus Finals, which you can find on Discord. Our sponsor today is DiplomacyBriefing.com, but since Umble is not able to be present with me, I'll just tell you it's an online diplomacy newsletter that keeps you up with the hobby. You can find it at DiplomacyBriefing.com. Instead of Umble, we've got an upgrade today. John, parentheses, <laughs> superstition on the Nexus server, who's some guru at the Nexus server, the leader of the Hearts Movement, all-around good guy, coming in to talk to us about the Season 5 pre-game uh, uh, analysis. Don, how are you doing? And Don, uh, what should I call you, Don or Superstition? I'm doing good. Uh, let's go Superstition, just because that's my... Uh... It's my conspiracy handle, and it's what I usually play under whenever I play conspiracy or diplomacy in general. So, uh, so for those of you who uh, follow this uh, video podcast or whatever it's called, this YouTube stream, we've interviewed Don at least one other time before, or Superstition at least one other time before, and I think I would uh, tell you his online style of play is... I'm, gonna be super nice to you and then kill you How, how's that <laughs> uh pretty close yeah if you want to summarize it that way that's fun um yeah i'm a big care bear but uh <laughs> being brought into the tournament setting definitely unleashed something different i didn't think i could do something like that so i'd say modified care bear <laughs> oh okay so i think uh correct me if I'm wrong, but between the two of us, we have been in three of the five uh, Nexus online final top boards. Is that right? I know I've been in only in one. I had a, another mediocre showing uh, this time, uh, but I believe you've been in two. I've been in two. Um, I participated in this season for only one game just because I was bored. Uh, I didn't have, have enough time to actually compete. Uh, I did have a board top, but it wasn't you know, one board top is enough to play. So, but yeah, so I've been in two. I was in the first season and I was in last season. Okay. Uh, how nonchalant of you. Uh, just, just a board top, but uh, didn't care about it <laughs> enough to keep going because uh, life got in the way. I could, I could have been on this top board. All right, cool. Uh, possibly. So, uh, I, I think I'd have a good shot, um, but never know. Can't win if you don't play. <laughs> this may be uh, the best stacked finals ever of, of the five. Not standing our own company here, we've got some great players, don't you think? I think there's definitely some standouts. Um, but yeah, it's a good board overall, by far. So before we analyze the board, just tell us a little bit about uh, what Nexus is and what you do for them. That's why we're here. Well, the Nexus in general is one of the first, if not the first, uh, Discord uh, community for diplomacy. And it is our mission to connect all the aspects of diplomacy the best that we can. We try to facilitate as much as we can on the site to other sites that um, can benefit you know, diplomacy members in general. So we're a site for good news. We run our own tournaments. And then we have our, our own community where People can do variants or find a game. Yeah. And how many members? Um, there's a lot. There's a lot. A uh, couple hundred at least. Is I'm this, not. Pez no, usually no, does. No, no. Them. I think it's higher than that. Yeah, I'm sure. Pez usually looks at all the numbers as far as that's concerned. Um, I usually, I, my, I personally try to manage the Discord and uh, try to do interpersonal communications with uh with different aspects trying to bring them into the nexus or get us all connected so i would i would tell you this it's a very welcoming community not like the rest of the internet <laughs> and if you're interested in diplomacy at all levels i think it's a fun place to go and discuss diplomacy and they've got a lot of great things going on they've uh, started a uh, speedboat league they've uh, uh I guess they might start a virtual league. They're they're they got their fingers uh, in lots of pies. 
We definitely do. Um, virtual league is probably going to be one of the harder things, <laughs> but we're starting yeah. to reach yeah. out to uh, more and more face-to-face -face players or virtual face-to-face, -face, especially with the uh, pandemic. So hopefully that's something, if we cannot get it hosted on our site, it's something we can continue to link and get assistance there. So the bread and butter, of course, is the uh, the online finals. Which, the Nexus Classic, yeah. Uh, the Nexus, yeah. Oh, is that what we're calling it now? The Nexus Classic, okay. <laughs> well, it's, like, it's the classic uh, map. So. I'll call it El, El Clasico. <laughs> uh, correct. So, uh, just how do you, you know, we have the standings here, we have the top seven who made the final board uh, on the screen, and it looks like, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but you got to play up to four games or an additional one as a substitute, and your top three were, were scored, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And as we look here at the standings, I see, uh, I'm assuming uh, that yellow, uh, because they all say 100, meaning 100 solos. points, were, were solos. Correct, yes, those are all solos. So, uh, so four of our seven players have soloed. The gray must be, didn't count. Those, the, those didn't are the dropped count. ones, yes. And then the top two had no solos at all, which is kind of interesting, and it's kind of nice that um, being a board topper is... Uh, more important than just getting one solo. Uh, I like the new scoring system because of that. It definitely isn't, you don't feel like you're pressured to have to get a solo. You just have to do well. What you, is the scoring system for those who don't know? I know it change, seems to change uh, frequently. Uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot. The first season it changed and then we went to just some of squares. Um, this is the first time we're using this system. It was uh, designed by Brandon Fogel. He was just talking about it. Um, I forgot what the tribute, it. tribute tribute method. system. So pretty much, you, you get points from each surviving player, and it, it it averages out, I guess, for the top player. But the second place player gets the biggest hit, and then you get lots of points just for surviving. So instead of people trying to give away the game when they're already lost, it um it definitely keeps the game more active throughout. It encourages board topping, and it also encourages Survival. people not to let someone get out in front. Correct. Yeah, correct, on both ends. It's, it's, it's very interesting. And so it's impressive, I think, to see people still solo, uh, as we had many solos here. Of course, the, uh, uh, the preliminary rounds have a variety of, uh, of players' uh, skill levels, so sometimes it's... Uh, depending on who you're going against to solo, it might be easier than, say, on the top board. Yes, for sure. All right, so uh, let's look at the standings here. The top guy uh, was uh, Otto Van Spankenhaus, who is the alter ego of Bender. And for those of you who don't know Doc Bender... I will share a little Doc Bender article with you. Doc Bender put up on the Nexus things that his name's uh, Michael Bender, and uh, he's an older player, and he's been playing diplomacy for a long time. If you look at this, he remembers that he first started playing 48 years ago in college. So that will give you an idea. Um, and he talks about that he's a face-to-face -face player, and that he's played on the judge system. And if you look at the scoring he did, he did very, very well. But what Doc Bender did not share, although I think it's uh, known, or if it's not known, as you can see here, is he is a world champion in the game of diplomacy. In 2012, he won the world championship, and not only just winning it, he soloed the top board. And the country he soloed with was France, the same country he's playing this time. Uh, so, you know, Doc Bender has got to be looked at as a big threat on this board. He's a, he's a real player. Yeah, he definitely looks like a, a force to be reckoned with. I'm kind of curious on how face-to-face -face translates to online. 
Um, I'm guessing that it's a better transition than vice versa, just because we have a lot more time to think about it on the online community. Um, but having that large reputation in general is going to be something scary. So it's something he's going to have to mitigate. So he described himself, uh, our colleagues at DBN, I, I, I hesitate to call them colleagues because they outclass us so much. Uh, put up uh, interviews, which you can find on Nexus or, or YouTube, uh, where they talk about uh, where he says he's an alliance player. I will tell you that in two of uh, Doc Bender's three games, two that he board topped, I was in those games. Uh, so uh, the first game, I played Russia, he played Austria, and uh, we faced an immediate, incredible, not incredible, but, but an immediate and credible Western triple. The doc uh, is one of these people who plays, who's a very gentle but forceful player and sort of demands of other players you know, that they make strategic choices or they're going to let down, you know, the alliance, so to speak. He, he likes to take charge. He likes to be in control uh, in that game. He eventually board top when the Western triple, of course, like all Western, not all, but most fail when Germany gets eaten up. He was there to uh, pick up the, the entrails of me, uh, Russia, uh, you know, sacrificing everything to fight North England and Italy sacrificing everything to fight France. Uh, Germany goes down, uh, and then Doc uh, comes out on top big time. So uh, he uh, was smart. I can't say uh, I had a, a bad thing to say about him. Very pleasant to play with online. Like I said, just forceful in personality. I think choosing France is really smart, too. Um, it allows him to have a lot of flexibility, and even influencing Italy in a little bit and, and being able to influence the, the eastern side as well. But it allows them to play defensively if they do try to gang up on him. And it allows them to move wherever he needs to move. Um, it sounds like if he's that flexible or an alliance player, he'll definitely have his pick of whoever he wants to play with. Yeah, and I in the second game, just uh, for what it's worth, uh, and uh, I can try and link the game on the Nexus server, but uh, he played up with 17 centers he could have soloed by 1905 uh that's how uh you know that was aided by me by the way why I, are you so bad i supported him into <laughs> i supported him into i i supported him into four centers uh to prove frankly to the people who were attacking me that i still had plays left uh and i could ruin their game by solo but as russia he was a bit of an opportunist because italy attacked austria austria decided to help him so uh, he then uh, crushes turkey while keeping austria at bay then crushes austria uh, let efg sort of have a eg against me i was france and then when they were committed to me uh, i supported him uh, all over into germany uh, and he just uh, crushed it, and then uh, I told him at that point uh, I'll draw that I, I, I was at a stalemate line, and so that's where that's where it ended. But not afraid to take an opportunity. He's a very good player. I think his biggest concern, and I'll I'll switch the uh, slide here because you you uh, you previewed a little bit. The player selected powers based on the uh, Paris method, and. Doc picked France, but immediately the two European players picked Germany and England. And I wondered right away, uh, given uh, the time zone uh, where Europe, you know, where they'll be able to talk a lot more frequently, whether those two uh, may have picked those countries in order to gang up on them. Or, you know, France was... He picked last, but I think that may have been part of the strategy. I don't think that's the case. Um, that's just my personal. Um, one thing for sure is that time zone doesn't matter nearly as much as far as I'm concerned, because I've stayed up till 3 a.m. talking to Conk, 
and I know it's old. I mean, he stays up all hours of the day. So as far as Conk is concerned, he can be at any time zone whatsoever. And I've known this true for many other players in general. They'll just they'll wake up, they'll play diplomacy. They'll have their lunch break, they'll play diplomacy. They'll get home from work before they go to bed. They'll wake up in the middle of the night if their phone goes off. These people play it very, very seriously. They have a notification, they're on it. And if you're not playing that hard, then you're probably getting outplayed. So, but uh, I do find a different culture between Americans and Europeans, and it might be a little bit hard for him to get Pi and EG because they might just click better. But it just depends. That's just my experience. I don't translate as well to Europeans, but he may have some kind of skill I don't have. Well, I don't know these players in particular, but I will give you uh, Kutsuvas bio here. Yeah. And I can tell you my experience with European players, and I think your experience from the season four finals is that they are into balance of power, and that's going to play well with a tribute scoring system. But Kutsuva from Germany is Italian, and his name is Alessandro Tavani. Do you know anything about him other than his uh, bio here in his interview at DBN? The only game I the only game I played I played versus him I was England and he was Russia. Um, I did everything I could to broker an alliance because I really like to do an over the top grab Denmark as England. I ended up doing it anyways without his help, but I tried everything I could to force that alliance and he was adamantly against me every step of the way. Um, it ended up causing his downfall when he built the fleet in the north. Because all I had to do is have Austria run through his middle, and that's exactly what happened. Um, I think he lacks a little bit of um, uh, emotional play. Uh, he's extremely strategic, and because he saw the beginnings of an EF, he automatically decided that strategically it was in his best interest to stay with Germany. So he will always look at the board as a static figure and not something that mutates with personalities. And that might help him in the finals because there's a lot more strategy that goes on. It doesn't really matter how you feel about somebody, but I feel like that's the weakness there, but uh, maybe that's my weakness in a finals board. So I don't know. Well, you know, the thing I learned about uh, the finals and playing on Nexus is the game ends in the fall of 1910, which in the preliminary rounds, I felt like I had to go up and go up quick, uh, you know, to try and get a top board. But in the finals, it's just what you said. The amount of press that players send to each other is is overwhelming. You have no idea. For those of you virtual face-to-face -face players or face-to-face -face players, I'm talking reams of press will go back and forth between these players in a 24 hour period. And, uh, there is a lot of time, even in 10 years, uh, to play, but people who can manage that well and understand that there's, there's time to make moves. Because if I remember correctly, uh, season four came down to the last year. Season three was basically over in 1909 but season two came down to the very last year as well. And I don't know about season one. Uh, you remember that. How, I, I mean, but do you go with my assessment that there's patience is a key in these finals? It can be. Um, you'll find that there's a lot more patient, methodical players in the finals. And if you try to act too aggressively, they'll take you out. And that's my problem. I just, I like to act fast, make a big, I was like, if I can get my feet in, and have a good ally, I can go. But it's just, the, it seems like slow and steady wins the race. Um, as, as far as uh, Katusa, um, when I had him on the ropes, I insinuated a lot of things as far as trying to get him to, you know, vassal up and, you know, defend himself long enough to maybe get a rebound because it was only, you know, halfway through. So, but he had already taken the loss and he's like, I'll just have to learn from what I've already done. And so he ended up being eliminated because of that. So the thing, the thing that stands out to me is he's only been playing for six months. 
and there's a lot of sharks on this board when France has been playing for 48 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and he, you know, Germany here, Katsuya was only playing six months. There's a whole lot of bag of tricks that Doc Bender knows that Katsuvov does not know. So he might be too cautious if, if you're telling me he's a, he's a very cautious player. I'm not sure if he's super cautious as far as he is. He, he, he approaches the game like it's a chess game, which is very normal uh, as you start diplomacy instead of thinking it as like a political game. Um, and he's amazing at reading the board and knowing which country needs to do what if this country does that. And so he's very reactive and you can see a lot more than most players can. And that strategy is a good foundation. He just needs to know how to talk when things don't match up with the way it should be. Because if you have a good words, people do stuff that doesn't make any sense. So, and yeah, so that's that's where his growing point is. But in a slow game, he still will be a force, especially as Germany. Um, I think it'll be very frustrating for people that want a long-term alliance when he starts reading the board and saying, no, you're too strong. Um, but we'll find out. I'm not a professional at how he plays, but I have a feeling that he's going to be a very frustrating Germany for the whole map. He's Germany, right? Yes. He's Germany. Yes. Okay, so let's go to England and, and finish off the West. Uh, Tangion, who's given his bio here let me get it up never heard used to have a problem getting up okay <laughs> uh who's a german uh marian or from germany he's been playing for three years and uh he, he likes to play games he says he, his favorite game is chess and diplomacy is is similar to chess i haven't played him i didn't play him do you have any uh, experience with them at all? I have no experience. All I've seen is what he's said and has uh, written in his bio. Uh, he's kind of a dark horse. Um, I don't even know people that have played him. Um, but the fact that he is very, he's European, he's German, and that he likes chess makes me think that he's more in the tangent sphere of thought. Um, and I think those two will get along famously on controlling the board. Uh, I, yeah, I think France has got their work cut out for him trying to pull one of them out. Uh, I'm not necessarily thinking they have a, the pre-arranged alliance, but I think the, that f- the England and Germany will probably see eye to eye on a lot of things as far as how the map goes and how alliances aren't very much their thing is, and more of dividing the map as a flexible control so no power gets too strong. So let's look at his uh, statistics. He played Italy uh, and survived, but didn't do well. He played Russia and was eliminated. Uh, he played Russia and, and did survive, but not very well. He played France and did very well. That looked probably like a shared board top, if I had to guess. And then as Turkey, he soloed. So uh, that solo is what got him in to the end into the finals here. So it doesn't so, surprise me that as he picked far as I know, we position. have not seen. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. He picked a corner position. It seems to be one of his stronger, stronger aspects being able to wait and see. And I was, I think he said that in an interview, he likes to wait and see and calculate his moves. So I think he'll do very well as England. So uh, I think we need to dedicate some time here to talk about, the enigma that is Village Idiot, uh, who revealed himself, the big reveal, like in The Empire Strikes Back, uh, <laughs> as Ewok, but it's really Village Idiot, who is humble, notwithstanding, superstition don't kill me, but I think he is the best online player in diplomacy. Uh, right now, uh, he, you know, he's gone. I thought his name was Chris. I just learned his name is Gary. It's whole. <laughs> I mean, the guy is a, an enigma, but he's a programmer. And uh, have you ever played him? I played with him in the uh, 
fundraising tournament. Um, and he is very empathetic and he is not directly manipulative, which is a very unusual trait for um, high top tiers. Um, so he would go with anything that you say and he'll put his own little spin on it. And he's very good at making personal relationships because it feels like it's all about you. And so, but it's very frustrating because he's a very cautious and reserved player. So he has that gung-ho, aggressive social game, but then he moves at a snail's pace where he can make cold calculated uh, responses and moves. And that was a little frustrating for me because I was like, you're not all in with me and now you're compromising my game because I have two feet in here and you're still way, way back. Um, but I mean, you can't really get mad at him because it's not like he, he lies. So, uh, he's definitely one to watch obviously, but, um, but yeah, I can't say anything more or less, but yeah, I would say he's probably the best. He hasn't played enough on the Nexus to outrank me yet, but he plays in enough other areas to do so, and I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure well, it's just a matter of time before he tops. Well, he Greg, I called you Gary. Apparently, his name's <laughs> Greg, not Gary. Uh, here, here's his uh, bio uh, uh, that he talks about. I'll share some experiences with uh, Village Idiot. Uh, in the season two finals, he was France uh, and I was England, and uh, he he did not lie to me uh, in the beginning, but he was very frustrating uh, to play with uh, because I couldn't get Germany on side, who was uh, Iozers, who's also very stubborn. So you know, here I am against two very stubborn players, and I like to find a partner, an alliance partner. Mm. And neither one of these guys wanted to wanted to jump in, you know, so to speak. It was, uh, you know, incredible. And then uh, eventually he he turned on me. Uh, well, not eventually, pretty early, uh, and. Um, and then we got an, you know, I got him back, and then we got, you know, got him back on side, and we're in a bit of an alliance for uh, because I didn't really know what I was doing uh, when I first started playing this uh, game a couple of years ago, and man, uh, he and I went through an epic uh, battle of words where. Uh, you know, we could write uh, uh, a checkoff play on almost how much unfiltered hatred we had of each other uh, <laughs> in, uh, in in that game, back and forth, back and forth. But uh, despite that, never uh, broke down on communications. Always, you know, tr you know, always hung in there. And I think he said it was it, it's true, but it, my feelings got hurt a little bit. Uh, in his interview on DBN, he was saying he was so focused on Conk and Umble playing France that he let mediocre players do better. Oh, uh, wow. Me and I, I was one of those me mediocre players. Uh, so Greg, thanks. I appreciate the fact uh, I'm mediocre, uh, but I, I will always have that I finished higher than he did in that game. <laughs> I think that's another one of, uh, he's going to have to worry about Conk being in the corner. Um, I just, I think they have such a rivalry. It'd be surprising to me to see a juggernaut. Uh, and I don't know. It's, I, I can't imagine him opening North. I don't imagine any finals opening North, but uh, I just, I think he's going to play very boring Russian moves until he can fill out exactly where everybody is. And it's going to be very frustrating for a lot of people. So the one thing about, uh, about, uh, home village idiot, uh, or Ewok or whatever we call him is the man, uh, uh, knows how to use the internet and he is fully aware of every game you've ever played and how you played it and is 
always thinking about it. I call him a, a pop psychologist, <laughs> but he put up a post about me. This is almost a, a year ago. You know, this is a year later, and we're still arguing over the season two final, which I will share with you that cut me to the core because he described me perfectly with his top pop psychology. You need to recognize something about Go Horns Go, and that is he has a very strong need to be liked, regardless of regardless of costs. So he understood my motivation as a player, which is I don't like to make enemies. I like to be liked, and he that, uh, and uh, uh, you know he found out about Umble, uh, researched Umble, knew everything about the guy. Guy when Umble uh, is, is a very private person, and so now that everyone's been revealed, I can tell you, he knows, but he doesn't just. You know, the players and their styles, he's played with these players before. And I will tell you, before we uh, get into who Conk is, I'll share with you another little snippet that that I share, uh, that I keep, because I learned from Village Idiot that, you know, you have to do research on players that you play. And here's what he said about Conk earlier in the year. A part of Conk's secret sauce is being able to connect with players, give them a fun experience, while behind his back he's performing sleight of hand that gets him stepped towards a win. And I think that is an accurate portrayal of Conk, who we'll be talking about next. What do you think? Um... Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, kind of, kind of a little basic, but yeah, I think Conk has a lot of little tricks up his sleeve. So, I, actually, I have that written down in my notes about them probably both agreeing to a secret juggernaut and how to hide it, but then both of them plotting behind each other's back to you know shift people this way or that way. So, I, I think the East will be a, a general mess with those two powers. Uh, just trying to out, out negotiate each other. Well, well, here is Conk. Uh, he says his name is Jordan Connors, and uh, I won't reveal his, his law firm, but uh, I can tell you that uh, he has uh, youthful looks and appearances. But it is uh, I am a lawyer of some note in my re- region for what I do. But Jordan Connors is a real lawyer at one of America's best law firms that only hires the best and the brightest. The guy is super, super intelligent and uh, is a fantastic writer. I am a fanboy of his. He's been in two prior finals, both of Italy, both where he gets knocked out quickly. Uh, And... You played with him last year in the finals. A theme from last year that I heard from every player about Conk was he overwhelmed me with press. And I wonder uh, what you think about uh, Conk's playing style. I really like playing with him because he's fun to talk to. And I think that's why he gets so far is that he's fun to play with and he is very engaged and upbeat um he actually got me to do some moves that i probably wouldn't have done and they didn't work out too badly for me but they definitely benefited himself the problem i have is that he is not a passenger he is always driving and when someone is driving their point to multiple people and people start comparing notes they look like a manipulator and it's easy to paint a target on them. And I think that's why he goes out so fast is because in a high level game, people start comparing notes and then no, it's nobody else's idea but his. And they're like, is he being genuine with me? Cause he's really nice, but now I just think I'm being played. And then everyone's like, well, yeah, let's get rid of him because uh, we don't know what's true anymore. So it's all coming from him one way or the other. So I think that's one of his biggest opportunities is being able to pause reflect and then try to make it someone else's idea instead of his own um 
But other than that, he's a very aggressive player like me. I think in a finals, um, it's good to pause and re- and take it slowly, especially as Italy. But um, trying to move as fast as you can, it's kind of – I really wanted to play with him, but he's a little far just because we think alike. I just – I want to go. I want someone to go with, and yeah. And it's just not the way on a top-tier board to do it, unfortunately. So if you can slow down I, I, I and, would, yeah. and, and, and listen and, and try not to steer unless he has to, I think he'll go very far. So he referenced a little bit of this in his interview at DBN uh, that, uh, that the, about the press, and I, I think he may have learned from that. But just a few stories about Conk for those who've never played him. He, he must have the all-time – I think he may be ranked number one on the Nexus uh, overall yes. standings. Uh, and, uh, you know, he does super well in preliminary games. I've played him three times in preliminary games and one time in the finals. Uh, one time in a, in a preliminary game, I was England, he was Germany. We had a fantastic EG going – until he decided to just inflict a crippling stab on me, uh, with uh, as, as a novice player, you know when that happens to you, it's just so deflating. But then the guy was so damn nice about it afterwards, like just so, you know, and he knew me enough well to say exactly kind of what I needed to hear, uh, and this village idiot thing about he wants you to have a fun time that's totally right. Now I totally did right. manage to sort of rally the board against, um, but, uh, you know, so that was that, uh, there was, uh, the other two games, uh, he soloed while I was on the board. Controversially, I gave him one of the solos. Uh, you know, I had him locked down on a stalemate on, I had already qualified, uh, for the finals, uh, and nothing could have stopped that. And Conk have qualified. He was uh, in eighth or ninth place. And I just thought he was such a good player. He literally then just asked. He goes, since you're already in, it's no harm to you to let me solo so I can get it. And I, I'm like, okay, the, you know. Yeah. Uh, like even that worked, you know. I've seen that. You know, I've seen that tactic actually so a lot, and it, it does work. It being able to be like, you don't need this. I need this, and and for some reason that conversation of uh, humility and giving someone the power to be like, you have my future in your hands, and it's it's a big ego inflator, and and it might be seen as metagaming, but at the same time, that's any point strategy thing. So. It's, it is what it is, and he used it to the best of his ability, and I, I definitely applaud him. I've seen Umble do something similar with uh, one of my hearts as well. So it's definitely a top-tier strategy when you need that win uh, to place, or even if you just want it like Umble did. And he's just like, I just want that win. But, um, but yeah. And the, the third time, just, as, just for a way of – just to point out, he was France, and he – uh, and I played Italy, uh, and uh, we knew each other right away. Uh, 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 I become sort of embroiled with Turkey, uh, you know, on a on a Lepanto. and I'm watching his, his moves because I'm always watching Conk because I'm worried when he's moving west, when he's moving west, east. I mean, he got three builds his frame, but was in London. He moved to the channel and then just moved his fleet directly into London. And, I mean, how often do you see that? Uh, he, you know, I don't know what he said to the English player, but uh, he has he, he is a snake charmer, particularly with, I would say, less skilled players. Yep. Uh, this is The challenge for him is, is going to be with higher caliber. Correct. It's because I, of the, how I much he talks. Very, it's easy I to... find it very, very it's easy to paint him as yeah, a villain. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Because of how much he talks, it's easy to paint him as a villain. And I think that's that's the problem. It's like, if everybody likes you, then there must be something wrong with you. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, it's one of my rules is if you get around, people will label you the uh, girl who gets around. So, 
no one want to be with you. So, so what I have <laughs> here, well, I hear you. Uh, <laughs> what I have up here uh, on Conk is, you know, he's Turkey, and that was the only game that got thrown out of his was playing Turkey. So, you know, the meta right now, particularly in virtual face-to-face, I'm not so sure in online. Turkey's done well traditionally in the uh, Nexus finals, uh, unless you're humble. And I hope you heard that humble. <laughs> uh, but but uh, uh, you've talked about whether or not he can get along with uh, Village Idiot. He's going to have to try. Yeah, I- I, I don't know. For some reason, I see an air coming, and that's just the way I feel. I don't, I, hopefully, that's not the case, because I don't want him to be eliminated for the third time right out the bat. But I think that might be where it goes. Um, I, seeing uh, Tom's interview makes it sound like he's a non-aggressive Austrian player who's going to probably set up for a Lepanta. Most likely, he's not going to go west, because it's not very smart initial play. You have, you know, Austria, which is a very alliance player. Um, So might get talked into an AT, but then I just, I'm not too sure. I'm not, I I really see an error coming, but we'll see. So EVR is Austria. And because I told you superstition, uh, you know, I play diplomacy for fun, but one of the things that I find to be fun is to do my, uh, is to to do the best that I think I can personally do. I, I remember from your interview that you said the country you like to play the most is Austria. Austria, yes, that's my favorite. It's... And our Austria is Eustachio Rauli. But before we talk about him, tell us why you like Austria so much. Uh, I like being in the East. Um, I like having that uh, diplomatic power you have tons of people to talk to and I feel like I can control how and what's going on. Whenever you play a corner power, people take what you say with a grain of salt. Austria really drives a lot of the game if they choose to, if they don't, they're just supply centers. Everyone's going to take. And I really think that um, Austria in this finals is probably the most heart like player on the map, which I think is a good thing with the power surrounding it. Um, He's not going to be able to drive a close alliance like he wants to, um, I believe, but he will be, I think that he'll be able to uh, keep everyone out of his uh, boundaries in the short term. Um, Considering he's balancing the juggernaut on both sides and that he's got Tom at his back, which is going to be great. I think that he's in a really good position that he can, make things happen the way he wants them to happen. So this is another, uh, you know, red flag for me. He's been to playing diplomacy e- even less than Kutsuov. Five months, not six, uh, as uh, as uh, our, our Germany has been playing. So, you know, he's got two sharks plus Italy is pretty experienced. Uh, it's it, it, This is always, you know, he's not going to have probably the sophisticated play that you're talking about to play Austria. And I like to play Austria as well because I'm, I'm a talker uh, and I can, I can get options going. Uh, I, I, but on the other hand, I like your thoughts on this. Uh, Umbo has given his opinion. I'd like to hear yours. Umble, Umble's strategy is he, he wants to align with the more experienced player because that person is going to be more reliable and probably do less dumb things. Whereas some players seek out the less experienced player to align with them because they can take advantage of them later if they think they have a degree of control. Uh, do you think you're calling him a heart already? Uh you know, which I've, uh, I've never played with him. I just all I, all I can see is is how you react and and how you like to play. And from everything that I've seen, he's the most heart like. I can't under I can't hundred percent say that, but 
uh, even if he is an inexperienced leap on the wind, I think between those three players, it's more than likely they'll use him as as a tool rather than just for centers. Because without an Austria there, it's going to be a very nasty East, and I I don't think any of them will place after that. I think they really need Austria for their game. You think that you you don't think an RT could get rolling? I don't think an RT will get rolling, mainly because you already have uh, two very strategic-minded players in Germany and England, and then a top tier in France. I think the Western Triple will jump, and the amount of uh, ability for that AI to work together, I think they'll have the whole map against them. I just think it's a losing scenario for them to jump in an RT. Um, and I don't know if there's enough trust there. I think there's enough of a rivalry to stop that. I think they might initially try to and try to hide it, but I think it's a farce. I think they're just going to either look for the air or it was like Russia will probably look to make sure that the um, AI is attacking Turkey and Turkey is going to try to have a side alliance with an AT. An AT is still possible. And with the, these two, it's the only way I see Conk really getting out is in an AT. But that's just my opinion. Well, you know Conk's going to work the angle if he's got it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's going to be necessarily bad for Austria either, but uh, definitely one to watch. Now, Italy is played by Poser Tom. Mm-hmm. And I'll put up his bio right here. Tom Mo in, in Portland, who's been playing for uh, 23 years, and he says it's all-time favorite game. And he's played uh, a lot on that, and he's done, obviously, very well. Have you played him? Yes. Um, I played him in one game. He was Germany. I was England. Um, He has a very straightforward talking method where he will lay out everything in a kind of like a sales pitch. Um, It's not emotional. That's why I gave him the nickname Iceman, because he tries to get you to do things that are self-beneficial, in the short term, um, he makes you think about things in a way that benefit him. And there was many times that I thought about flipping on my alliance when uh, when he would talk to me. So he's very um, strong at manipulation, but I don't think he excels as much with the um, <laughs> with the uh, interpersonal relationships. Well, uh, you know. You know, he probably knows uh, Doc Bender in France. That might be to them. Uh, so I, I suspect uh, he, he probably uh, focuses, as, uh, as most Italy's do, on the East. Most likely. I, I see I see him focusing, focusing on the East. I would not be surprised of a strong central alliance at first. Um possibly with the uh, with the air and he might break off into a winter green so he, in mid game so he can actually top the board a little bit. I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon. The thing I wonder about is will he join if there's an E a European EF will he join in a triple attack against France? What do you I, think based on your experience with him? I don't I don't really see that. Um, I think he'll he'll weigh the options, but he he's not going to make that aggressive play. I don't think. I think that he'll open as safely as possible and see how the board shakes out. No one wants to be left trying to stab someone when no one no one else commits. And for Italy, it's the, the smallest gain, so he can always join after the fact if if it looks like there is an EG versus France. Well, I, just, I think it's fascinating. So. You know, is there going to be an EG? Is there going to be an RT? Uh, will, you know, uh, you know, how do players work with Austria uh, when Austria is surrounded by three extraordinarily experienced players? Uh, it, it, you know, I think it's going to make for a, uh, a terrific finals. One of the things that we've seen in, in these finals, surprisingly, uh, over and over again is Austria and Italy at war. Uh, And I wonder if we will, which has only worked out well once. Uh, That was for Paola in season two. Oh, Uh, no, no, no. I wonder if we will see that again. Um, 
I was, oh, that's true. Season and, one. I, uh, I, yeah. yeah. It, Italy would have won it had they not dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't see that happening. I see that uh, if Austria plays the way I think they play, I think that they'll form that alliance with Italy pretty strongly. And I think Italy is a smart enough player where they can see that it's more of a wait and see kind of game. I, I don't think that alliance, I think AR is going to be fairly strong, at least into the mid game. You predict, you predict the early AI. I do. And, yeah. and then with it, with, with, with the Russian help, probably against Conk, that's the way you're, you're just, just thinking about it based on the players. Of course, you know, we don't know what's going to happen diplomatically. But yeah, this is the first time I've ever been able, well, the second time, I guess, that the finalists know exactly who's who, which is definitely going to be something that influences the game. Because before, you know, it was anonymous. So only season three was not anonymous. Yeah, but in season two, everybody knew, everybody internally had worked it out pretty quickly. Yeah, usually by the end of 1902 or beginning of 1902, people have figured it out. Um, but sometimes having that initial thought about what people are going to do uh, definitely helps. Because if, if I know this person doesn't really like to attack Austria, then I can be a little bit more aggressive as Austria. Uh, if I don't know, I might just jump into a hedgehog and do a wait and see. So it, it can definitely influence the game. In the games are won in the first year, in my opinion. I, I know a lot of people think that it's a long game, but if you don't make the necessary uh, actions in the first year, there's there's not a lot of comeback. Sometimes, but not not to me. Well, I think your game can be over in the first year, but I I'm not sure I, I agree that it can be uh, won in the first year. Uh, all right, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Who will win the season five Nexus final? I'm writing this down. Who will win? I'm going to give it to Russia. I think that was a poor poll. I actually, that might be my new favorite uh, position to play, but people knowing who he is, it might make it a little bit harder. But for the most part, he has some of the best negotiations, and he has four people that border him that, I think we'll we'll give him enough leeway. I don't think he'll get enough coordination against him. Russia's just too easy to defend if you don't have everyone on the same same board. And with France being a top tier player, I don't think Germany and England can really afford to keep him under control and turn their back on him either. So it, it really depends on how Germany and, and England really want to balance this game. Because they're they're more balanced players, so. But I think Russia just being in the East and the East being more volatile, I think they're going to get the leg up. I'm gonna. I have a hard time disagreeing with it, but for, for me, my rooting interest is for Conk being eliminated twice early as Italy. Well, I don't think he was eliminated early the second time, but he was he was eliminated uh both times uh and i i love a uh comeback story i'm an american i love a comeback so uh i i'll i'm gonna say conk uh conk can do it but man having played doc pinder and village idiot uh by the way village idiot did top the board with a game with doc bender in it if you look uh, so uh, the two of them have played in the prelims with uh, Ewok or Village Idiot coming out on top. But, uh, 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 you know, uh, it could go to anyone. And if you're listening to this, I don't discount a single player because if you're listening to this dummy, I finished second. So a lot of things can happen in the final on the final board. So it's really anyone can do it. Um, and, uh, you know. I would like Poser Tom, but for the fact that he's playing Italy uh, as well, I mean, just I feel bad uh, on that because I don't think Doc is going to let him go west, and I certainly don't think Conquer uh, 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 Village Idiot is going to have much of an interest in him going east. But we will, we will see. I think it's going to be fantastic. Superstition, thank you for joining me today and throughout the finals to discuss. Anything else you want to say? Yeah, I just think it's a, um, it's a matter of who paints the biggest target on the opposite side of the, opposite side of the map. 
and you know, and I really, really want Austria to do well. I actually, that's who I'm rooting for. <laughs> he, he, you're rooting for him. All right. All right. Good luck, everybody. We will be here. Thanks to diplomacybriefing.com. Thanks to you, Superstition. We will have hopefully some surprise guests and analysis uh, throughout these finals, which we are happy to bring to you. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye.